if you're here visiting for the first time, we are so glad to have you. Dads, we're excited to have you on Father's Day. By the way, a little interesting known church fact. Mother's Day is one of the highest attended weekends of the year. Okay, look around. Father's Day is one of the lowest attended weekends of the year. Now, let me just ask you a question. Does that mean that women are more godly than men? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, I was telling Laura, Mother's Day is about mom getting everybody together. Let's go to church. That's very important to mom. Dad's like, give me four hours. I'm playing golf. Don't even talk to me, right? So, but man, we're glad you're here. We're glad you carved time. Uh, we're in a series. Uh, we're the fourth week. We're calling Meet the Gospel. It's based on the first five chapters of the book of Romans. By the way, as I was, as I was preparing for this week, I, I could not help but think about uh, the tragedy in Orlando uh, last Sunday. I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware of it. I left ha- the house. I leave about 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and I just heard the local news saying we're following a shooting in Orlando, and my day didn't slow down to about 10 o'clock last Sunday night, and that's when I turned the news on and heard it. I mean, just absolutely evil personified what happened there, and I just want us to make sure we continue uh, to pray for those loved ones and that very, very traumatic situation there. But as I was thinking about that, I couldn't help but think about this series because, you know, we, have, we love to ask the question, what's wrong with the world? How do we fix what's going on, you know? And let me just say this. Nothing will fix this world other than the gospel. You just need to know that. Uh, les- legislation won't fix it. Republicans can't fix it. Democrats can't fix it. Giving everybody a gun won't fix it. Taking away all the guns won't fix it, you know? And just accepting everybody into our country won't fix it. Banning people from our country won't fix it. The reality is we're depraved. And the only way you can change the world is with the gospel. And that's what we've been talking about in this series. A couple of weeks ago, I said that one of the reasons I believe that God gave us the book of Romans is to remind us, don't ever forget what your life was like before Jesus. And I think that's probably why Paul takes so much time in the very first part of the book to remind us of what our life was like before we met Jesus Christ. And as we've seen in this series, it's it's not a pretty picture. And Paul continues that theme all the way through chapter one. Last week we saw all the way through chapter two. He actually uh, uh, just continues on that theme all the way up to chapter three, verse 20. But then when you get to chapter three, verse 21, Paul says this, but now. In other words, uh, yeah, we, we are depraved people, but with the gospel, he says, but now. And a few weeks I described it. It's like, you know, you know living in a dark, dirty, stinky alley in New York City. And one day you, you, you stumble out and you, you, you find Times Square. It's like, wow, whole different world, right? That's what it's like after you begin to follow Jesus. After you're exposed to the gospel, it's a whole different world. In fact, I made a list of the contrast just to remind us of the way things were before Jesus compared to the way things are after Jesus. For example, before relationship with Jesus, we were under God's wrath. Afterwards, we're under God's grace. Before, we were spiritually dead. Afterwards, we're spiritually alive. Before, we were guilty before God. Now, we've been declared righteous. Before, we were condemned. Now, we've been forgiven. Before, we needed salvation. Now, salvation has been provided. Before, it was all about works, trying to be religious, trying to work our way into a relationship with God, trying to please God. Now, it's all about faith, accepting God's free gift of salvation. That's the book of Romans. Let me show you how it all ties together. In the book of Romans, everything kind of hangs together like links in a chain of thought. And if you take out one of those links, the the book of Romans becomes just a a, a, a jumbled mass of ideas that seem to have no connection whatsoever. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Paul begins by saying this in chapter 1, verse 16 of Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And so far we've learned that the gospel is based on the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood to pay for our sins. We're gonna see that this weekend. Three days later, he rose from the dead to verify and validate that he indeed was the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And if we will put our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us, we can be reconciled back into a relationship with God. That is the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. And then he goes on to say, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And most people read that and think it's a reference to God's righteousness, an attribute of his character. But Paul is actually talking about the fact that as individuals, we can actually be infused with God's righteousness so that from God's perspective, we have value, we have worth in his eyes. And then immediately Paul turns uh, to our need for this righteousness. And he says in chapter one, verse 18, the wrath of God is being 
revealed. And then he beats this just to death for, for three chapters. He talks about blatant sinners. He talks about self-righteous moralists. He talks about the religious do-gooder. He says, at the end of the day, we're all just as lost. At the end of the day, we're all just as depraved. We've all climbed out of the, the same cesspool. We all need the gospel. We need the gospel. And so now you get to chapter 3, verse 21. And he says, but now. And when he says that, he comes back to the gospel. So as you're reading the book of Romans, think of Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through Romans chapter 3 verse 20. It's kind of like a parenthetical section where Paul wants to make sure we understand our need for the gospel. But once he's made his case, he comes right back to the message of the good news and he begins to clarify what is the gospel all about. And in doing so, Paul gives us four insights to the gospel. We're going to unpack them one at a time, but understand what we're getting ready to look at at the end of Romans chapter 3. It is the doctrine of the gospel. I mean, it doesn't get any deeper than this, any more profound than this when we think about the gospel. Let's look at the insights. The first insight is this. The gospel is a transfer of God's righteousness to our lives. Look what he says beginning chapter 3 verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you grew up in church, went to Sunday school, maybe Awana, maybe you memorized that verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But contrary to popular opinion, that is not the emphasis of Romans chapter 3. In fact, verse 23, all have sinned, it's almost an afterthought. Paul has already, he's already, he's already presented the fact, developed the fact in three chapters that we all are depraved, that we all sin, that we all fall short of God's expectations that he has for us. He's moved on from that. Now he's shifting his emphasis to the righteousness of God. And Paul gives us a couple of insights, a couple of truths about this righteousness that is literally transferred from God, his righteousness, to our lives. Let me give it to you. First of all, it has nothing to do with the law. So Paul says, understand, this righteousness that God gives us, it has nothing to do with rules, regulations. It's not based on our behavior. In fact, look at what he says in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, that's all those rules, regulations, and behaviors, right? The righteousness of God. And once again, Paul reminds us that we cannot experience the righteousness of God by behaving a certain way. We can't experience the righteousness of God by doing certain things. You can't dig into your pockets of good deeds and pull out a lot of good stuff and, and say, look, God, I deserve your righteousness. Look, God, I have earned your righteousness. Paul says it just doesn't work that way. It has nothing to do with the law. And then second, he says righteousness isn't something new. This isn't something new that came around when Jesus came to this earth and, 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 and we have the gospels. It says this in verse 21. The righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. That's a reference to the Old Testament. The righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So understand, this idea of being righteous, this idea of having a right standing before God, this isn't some newfangled idea. Paul says the law, the whole sacrificial system, the priests, the animals, the writings of all those prophets throughout the New Testament predicting that one day the Messiah would come. All of those things said, this is the way that you are going to be righteous before God. And it doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew. Doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. That's anyone who's not a Jew. Doesn't matter if you're a Catholic or a Baptist. Doesn't matter if you call yourself a Muslim or Hindu or whatever it is. What if, there's, there's only one way that you're going to have a relationship with God according to the Bible. There's only one way you're going to experience God's righteousness. Now, before I go any further, i got to explain a couple of terms. And let me just say, one of my pet peeves about Christians is that we have our own little language. I call it Christianese. And Christians say things and talk in a way that nobody else in society talks. It's almost like we had code words, right? In fact, uh, I was reminded of that by this little video. It's entitled, Shoot Christians Say. Watch this. Bless his heart. He's backsliding. <laughs> I mean, isn't that true? Everybody has to be wondering, what, what are you talking about, right? And you know what? I would like to say and hope we don't do that, but you know, I made a list of things. Uh, discovery class. If you're new, you don't have a clue what that is, but the insiders know. It just means our membership class. Why don't we just say membership class? You want to be, in fact, we don't even call you a member. We call you a mission partner, see? So here's another. Hazardous. That's our middle school ministry. Now, that may be the only one that's accurately named. You put 400 middle schoolers in a room, something hazardous is going to happen, right? How about, how about next steps? See, it would be way too confusing to say information. 
If you want information about hope, no, you got to go to the next steps. Here's another first impression. What does that mean? When we talk about bless the missionary, build a hedge of protection. You heard it in the video, traveling mercy. Who says that? Whoever says it, the company. Hey, uh, going on a business trip, pray for traveling mercy. No, that, nobody talks about that. Uh, here's another one, missional. We've got to be missional. Here's the new one that's been floating around our staff, socialization. I said, somebody used it like six times in a meeting. And I'm like, what does that mean? They finally said buy-in. I say, okay, let's say buy-in. Tell me that. I understand buy-in. But we have all of these terms that we use. But what's interesting is there are some actually biblical terms that we don't ever use in our daily conversations, but they could actually change your life if they ever got from your head to your heart. Let me give you a few. Righteousness. Righteousness. I guarantee you, you did not use the word righteousness in one conversation this week, right? But the root of the word righteousness is the word worth. It's the idea of being valuable. It's the idea of being significant. By the way, there's an incredible longing in our culture, and our society, for worth and value and significance. In fact, I believe that the majority of the people that we rub shoulders with every day struggle with feelings of inferiority. They struggle with feelings of inadequacies. And yet, when you have Jesus Christ in your life, God gives you his righteousness and says that you have maximum worth. You have maximum value. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of anyone else that I would rather have consider me valuable than God. But again, it's not something that we can earn. It's not something we deserve. It's not something that's naturally in us. It's not in our DNA. And that's why Paul uses a very, very particular term to describe it in verse 24. This act of God's righteousness, when we are declared righteous, this act of God's righteousness being transferred to our lives is referred to as justification. That's the second term. We are justified. Look what it says in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he goes back to the subject of those who believe. And we all are justified. Now, I grew up in church, and so I've heard people say my whole life, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. God sees me just as if I'd never sinned. That is a bad definition. If that's what you think it is, purge it from your memory forever. Let me give you an accurate definition of justification. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares us righteous while we are still sinners. See, when God declares us righteous, he doesn't pretend we've never sinned. He doesn't get the attitude, well, maybe they're not quite as bad off, not as depraved as I thought they were. It means that while you were still a worthless, no good sinner, while you were still depraved, which we learned the first week means that you were as bad off spiritually as you could possibly be, even while you were in that state, God declared you righteous. Even while you were in that state, he gave you worth, he gave you value, and now you are absolutely 100% accepted by him. But again, understand, it's not because of anything you've done it's because now you are in Christ. Once you become a Christian, once you accept God's free gift of salvation made possible, you are, the Bible says you are in Christ. You're like the bottle cap, okay, my hand will be, you're like in Christ. And so when God looks at you, when he looks at me, he sees me through his son who is perfect and righteous, and so he sees me positionally perfect and righteousness. Now, I'm not there in my experience. My day-to-day -day life, Laura will be the first one to tell you, I am not perfect, and many days I am not very righteous. In fact, many of us in our experience, we're still down here, right? Yeah, we're Christians, we've accepted God's free gift of salvation, but we're still making the same mistakes, doing the stupid bonehead things we've always been doing, right? Our goal as Christians is to change that. That's why our mission statement is love people where they are, but encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And as we go on this journey, we should become more and more like Jesus Christ. One day we will be like him, but it's, it won't be till we get to heaven. But, but, but right now, when we are in Christ, when God is looking at you right now, positionally, he sees you perfect. He sees you righteous as he sees his very son, Jesus Christ. And if that does not help you with your self-esteem, if that doesn't help you with your self-worth, I'm telling you, I got nothing. I can't encourage you at all, right? God declares you righteous. He says you have value, you have worth when you make that step, step of faith and begin to believe in Jesus Christ. Here's the second insight. We are justified without doing anything to deserve it. In other words, this righteousness that's transferred to our life, justification, we can't do anything to deserve it. Look at verse 24. And all are justified freely. That, that word freely in the Greek, it means without cause, without reason. It's the very same word that Jesus used in John chapter 15, verse 25, when he said, they hated me without reason. They, they hated me. They didn't have any cause to hate me. So this says that God declares us righteous even though he has absolutely zero reason to declare us righteous. 
In other words, God doesn't look down at us and see how we're behaving. He doesn't look down at you and say, well, look at her on the front row of church this morning. She looks like a good person. I bet she serves some, probably here all the time. I want her. But him, mm, he looked like a loser. He looked like a loser. By the way, you guys stand up. Let me show you the coolest. Just stand up. I want to show you. This is the coolest couple at Hope Community Church. Turn around. Turn around. Tur look at them. Look at them. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Don't you wish you looked half that cool? See? But God doesn't do that. He's a, he doesn't say, I, I'll take her because she looks like a really good person. She's trying really hard. But I don't want him because he's a loser. See, it doesn't work that way. God declares us righteous when we have absolutely nothing that he wants, absolutely nothing that he needs from us. In other words, he takes us even though there is nothing in us that's desirable. And here's the cool thing. He did it for no reason at all, just because. Parents, have you ever had your kid do something really dumb? And you say, like, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? Have you ever had this answer? I don't know. Just because. And you're like, what? That is not a reason. Why did you do that? Just because. Understand that is actually a biblical answer. That's a biblical answer. Right? Husbands, use that. When your wife says, honey, do you love me? Yes. Why? Just because. She can't argue with you. It is a biblical answer. I mean, if you were to ask God, do you love me? God would say yes. And if you said, why do you love me, God? He would say, ah, just because. No reason, just because. And let me show you how this was illustrated in the life of the Jews. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven. You know, we all know the Jews were God's chosen people. Why did God choose the Jews? You know, why didn't he choose the Puerto Ricans? Or, uh, why, I mean, why did God say the Jews are gonna be my chosen people? And well, well, you think, well, maybe, maybe they were the smartest. Maybe they were the best looking. Maybe they were the strongest. Maybe they were the most numerous. There must have been a reason. Why did they deserve to get to be God's chosen people? Well, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse six. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And that's it. You won't find any other reason. God chose the Hebrew people. He decided to love them. That's it. He made a promise and he keeps his promises. He swore to Abraham, I will love your descendants and I will never forget your descendants. For no reason at all. And for what reason did God have for justifying us? Well, according to the verse here, Romans 3.24, just because. But do you know what's so cool about that? You know what that means? It means that everybody has an equal opportunity to have a relationship with God. Everybody has e equal access to God. God loves the world without cause. God loves the world without reason, and he offers eternal life to everyone. See, a lot of people say that Christianity is narrow. It's just for those of us who believe it. No. The beautiful thing about it, it is available to anyone who believes. It's available to anyone. Here's the third insight. The gospel costs us nothing but it cost Jesus everything. Look at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption, there's our third term, redemption, that came by Christ Jesus. What does redemption mean? It simply means to purchase with a price. It's a word that goes all the way back to slavery. When this was written, a slave would be put on the auction block in the marketplace, and a slave owner would come into town and he would go to the marketplace and he would go in and he would evaluate the slave that was standing on the auction block and he would bid on that slave and he would purchase that slave and he could take that slave home. And once he got that slave home, do you know if he chose to kill that slave, it wasn't considered a problem? That was his option. Because in the slave owner's mind, a slave was nothing more than a tool, nothing more than an instrument, nothing more than a piece of farm equipment. And Paul uses that analogy, and in the same way, Paul here views us as being born into the slavery of sin, and God put us on the auction block. But the picture is one day Jesus came to the marketplace, and he saw us, and although we had nothing to offer him, he bid on us, and he paid the price for us with his death, and he took us by the hand, and he led us away from the marketplace. But once we got away, he said, you are free to go. You are liberated. I paid the price. That's redemption. Cost us nothing. Cost him everything. 
Here's the fourth insight. The gospel is a display of love. Now, it's interesting, if you've been paying attention, the last few verses have been from man's perspective. We've been justified, redeemed, we've been delivered, we've been declared righteous. But when you get, when you get to verse 25, Paul changes things up, and he begins to give us some truth from God's perspective regarding the death of his son. And this is something I want you to hear. Let me put it up. We're not the only ones who benefit from the death of Jesus. The father benefits also. In fact, there are two major benefits for the father as a result of the death of his son, Jesus. First of all, his heart was satisfied. But here's one maybe you've never heard before. The scandal against his name was cleared. Wait, wait, what is that? There was a scandal against God? It was like something, like a lawsuit in his background we didn't know about? What is that all about? I'm going to try to explain it to you, but it says this in verse 25. God presented, and the Greek word is put on display. So God put on display Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Maybe you have the New American Standard. I actually prefer that when I'm studying. This is what it says. Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. There's our word for the weekend. Everybody say propitiation. Say it again, propitiation. You can't say it without smiling. Propitiation. It's a cool word, right? God presented us. What does it mean, propitiation? It means satisfaction. So you could read verse 25 this way. God put on display Christ as a sacrifice of satisfaction. What does that mean? This is what it's saying. Not only did God have his justice satisfied by the death of his son on the cross, his broken heart was also satisfied. Let me give you. Let me give you an example. A lot's been going on in Orlando this week. Did you? I'm sure you saw the story about the young couple whose um, two-year-old son got snatched by the alligator. And as a parent, you think, what must have that to sit there and watch that take place, right? I, I remember I was up early watching the news, and Laura got up. I said, "Honey, you got to watch this." I said, "Can you imagine anything from a parent's perspective worse than having to go through watching that happen?" And I'm sure, I'm sure as this plays out, I'm sure maybe there'll, maybe there'll be a lawsuit, maybe there won't be a lawsuit. I guarantee you this, somehow it will be settled. And somehow Disney, probably very generously, will give them an incredible amount of money, right? So it will be settled. But even though it will be settled, you know in the heart of those parents, that will not take away the hurt, the bitterness, the loss, right? Now, I want you to think about that same analogy and apply that to the Heavenly Father, Think of it this way, God created mankind in his image. But you gotta understand, when mankind turned their back on God and sin, it broke God's heart. See, we don't think about that, do we? It absolutely devastated him. In fact, it put resentment in the heart of God. And if you have a hard time believing that about God, Genesis chapter six, verse five says this, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Now understand, we're only six chapters into the Bible and it's gotten bad. And that he saw that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry. Literally, the Hebrew word is he resented that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. In other words, it hurt God that he created mankind in his perfect image. It grieved him that he created them that way. And now looking at man, they were so evil. And his justice required that something die. Something's gonna have to die to pay for this sin. By the way, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, you, you, you go to the movies now, and it's like, this, I think it's like an hour and a half of previews now, right? It's kind of a preview of coming attraction, right? Genesis chapter three is kind of like a preview of coming attractions. Because you remember Adam and Eve sinned, and they were naked, and they realized they were naked for the first time? And what did God do? He killed an animal, he skinned it, and he covered them up. God was giving a preview of a coming attraction that something's gonna have to die Blood is going to have to be shed for my justice to be satisfied. And when Jesus finally died, the justice of God was satisfied because the payment was made. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. What I came here to do has been taken care of. But understand, another benefit was that the resentment of God towards mankind was also satisfied. What does that mean to us? It means now that God is satisfied, I can approach God without me having to worry about whether he's still harboring bitterness against me. Is he still holding bitterness against my sinful past? In other words, not only am I accepted by God, 
Not only am I loved by God, he likes me. That's a big deal, right? Because have you ever been in a relationship where you've used this? I love you, but I do not like you right now. You ever said that to your kids? Yeah, we all have. I have. I probably shouldn't tell you that on Father's Day. But anyway, uh, you know. So not only does God love us, he likes us. Even more importantly, he enjoys being in a relationship with us. So you had no idea that propitiation could be so exciting, did you? Right. But again, it's a truth we need to understand. How many of us feel like, yeah, God loved me, and I'm in a relationship with him, but our perspective is he is a big bully with a club, and he would, like, knock me upside the head anytime. No, he likes you. He likes you. He enjoys you. Do you know what Romans 3 says to us? It says if you're sitting here this weekend and you're still trying really, really, really hard to get back on God's good side, you are working for no reason at all. Do you know what this says? And I don't know any other way to say it, and it sounds kind of crude, but it means Jesus paid God off. That's what happened. Jesus paid God off. Jesus' death satisfied every demand of the Father. And by dying, see, Jesus rebuilt the bridge between God and mankind that was torn down by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In fact, Romans chapter 3 is all about the bridge. It says to us, it says to all of us who are sinners, us, you're lost. You're dying, you will die, but if you will accept what Jesus Christ did on your behalf, you will be declared righteous, and you will be able to move it back across the bridge. You'll be able to be restored back into a relationship with God, but that's the only way you will be restored back into a relationship with God. What did Jesus say in John 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets back to the Father except through me. He said, I'm the bridge, I'm the bridge. But I also said that the scandal against God's name was cleared when Jesus died. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, propitiation, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now, here it is. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, and that's just another word for patience, he had left, now look at this, he had left the sins previously committed beforehand unpunished. What? There were things that God overlooked. And because of that one statement, there, will, there are people who will argue that God is contaminated because he overlooked the sins of the people in the Old Testament. He didn't hold them accountable. He just kind of loved them. See, he loved Moses, even though Moses was a murderer. He loved David, even though David was an adulterer. He loved Jacob, even though Jacob was a deceiver. And so the argument is, God is contaminated. He's not as pure as you thought he is because he didn't do anything about their sin. And you know what Paul says? Guess what? That's true. He said that's true. In that sense, God did leave the sins previously committed before Jesus unpunished. But notice what it says in verse 26. Why? He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And what does that mean? Well, think about it this way. It means that Jesus' death on the cross was retroactive. That's what it means. See, our faith, we look back, right? We look back 2,000 years, and our faith is that Jesus did. We see, we weren't there. We weren't there. We didn't see it. So we have faith in the fact that Jesus was who he said he was, and he died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead, and we look back. That's our faith. But see, in the Old Testament, you look forward. That one day, remember what the prophet said? The Messiah will come. Isaiah said he'll be like a lamb led to the slaughter. And so if I'm David, if I'm Moses, I don't have Jesus to look back to, but I'm looking forward to a day when God will bring his son, the Messiah, to this earth, and he will live a perfect life, and one day he will die on the cross for my sins, and he will be raised from the dead to prove that he was indeed the son of God. We look back. They look forward. Their faith was just as much as our faith. It went all the way back to Adam and David and Moses and Jacob. In that sense, Jesus' death took care of all sins. Past sins, present sins, future sins, he paid the price. And so when Jesus died and rose, all of those Old Testament saints who had looked forward to the Messiah, they were declared righteous. It had been fulfilled. By the way, Paul repeats three times in these five verses. It's all by faith. 
It's all by faith. Verse 22, righteousness is given through faith. Verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Verse 26, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Why does he keep repeating that? I think he repeats it so much because I think we have a hard time believing we can get something for nothing. See, that's kind of illogical to us who are Americans. So you get what you pay for, right? You get what you earn, no free ride. With every privilege comes responsibility. If you get something for nothing, it's not worth having. How many times have we said that? But then Jesus, God comes along and says, I have an offer, it's eternal life, but it's not gonna cost you a thing. And our response is, ooh, you better watch out for stuff like that. Nah, so there's a catch in there somewhere. So what do we do? We work, we take matters into our own hands, we go to church and we give and we serve and we go to small group, we get baptized, we get confirmed, we try to do all these things. We think we're gaining on it. We think we're making progress, getting back into a relationship with God. And God is sitting in heaven like, ah, ain't nobody got time for that. Nobody got time for that, you know? That's not the way, it's a free gift. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, you latched onto that. You're like, well, does that mean I don't have to give and I don't have to serve? No, 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 no. We don't do those things to get God to love us. We do those things because God does love us. Right? It's out of a response to what he's done for us. Right? But God says, I'm giving it to you. It's free. We can't believe it. It makes no sense whatsoever. But let me ask you a question. Are we really getting something for nothing? No. So we've already seen that this weekend. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, you're not your own. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. In other words, Jesus picked up the tab. We get the benefit. He paid the price, and now he says to us, it's yours. But you're going to have to accept it by faith. Now, Paul, he asked three questions to close out the chapter. Question number one, verse 27, he says, where then is boasting? And the answer is, well, there's, there's no boasting in the gospels. Like Tom Hanks, there's no crying in baseball. Paul says, there's no boasting in the gospel. Nobody's going to walk into heaven like a peacock. You know, ah, you're so lucky to have me. I deserve to be here, right? No, no, understand something. If you get into heaven, it will be by the grace of God, right? And you're going to get there. Guess what? You're going to be around people who were religious their whole life, good people, but they never accepted what Jesus Christ did for them. You're going to be shocked by who's there and by who's not there. But that's okay. They're going to be shocked you're there. So it all kind of evens out, right? <laughs> but here's the cool. If we get there, understand it will not be based on anything we've done. It will be based on the grace of God. There's nothing to boast about. Question two, can anybody qualify? Look what it says in verse 29. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith. That's the Jews. We talked about that last week. And the uncircumcised, that would be the Gentiles, through that same faith. In other words, it's, we don't need two different gods, one to love the Jews, one to love the Gentiles. Since God is one, he loves them both, he'll take them both. Understand, it is available to anyone who is willing to accept the gift. You know what people ask me all the time? Will Muslims go to heaven? Will Buddhists go to heaven? Will Hindu go to heaven? I mean, they believe in a God. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is what the Bible says. Now, you can believe anything you want to believe. It's America. But this is what the Bible says. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. If you want to have a relationship with the Father, there's only one way. It's got to come through me. You say, no, that's narrow. It's kind of bigoted. Nope. It's beautiful. It's available to anyone who wants to take the gift. Third question. What about the law? Do we then nullify the law by this faith? No. Paul says, not at all. It's, interesting. it's a Greek word, meganoite. It means don't even have that thought. Rather, we uphold the law. In other words, he says, we, yeah, we try to live God's law. We try to live out the Ten Commandments, the do's and don'ts of the Bible. But you got to understand, the law is like a mirror. It shows you that your face is dirty, but it won't clean your face. That's what the law does. It shows us that we are dirty, that there's sin in our life, that we could never meet God's standard of righteousness. But it tells us that if you'll accept the gospel, what Jesus did on your behalf... That's how you'll become righteous. That's how you'll have a right standing before God. And in that sense, once the law points us to Jesus and our need for Jesus, the law's done its job. That's why God gave us the law. Two thoughts, and I'll conclude. Here's the first one. Salvation is a gift. It's not a reward. It's a gift. It's not a reward. And if you don't learn anything from the book of Romans, you have learned the book of Romans. 
It is a gift, it's not a reward. But you'll hear all the time, yeah, 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 I know you accept the free gift of Jesus Christ, but you gotta add this on, and you gotta really, really work on that. And you gotta stop doing these 15 things, and you gotta start doing these 20 things. It's all a lie. It's all wrong. The message of the gospel is that it is a free gift. It is not a reward based on our good behavior. And here's the second thing. The focus of the gospel is the father, not the sinner. And I think we need to hear that because we live in a culture where it is all about us, right? But you gotta understand, the plan exalts the father. He gets the glory. He put it together for his benefit. You see, when we sin, I've, I've said this before, the Bible is nothing more than an epic love story of God's relentless pursuit of mankind to be in a relationship with him. He's head over heels in love with us. And I don't know what your perception of God is, but that's how God feels about you. So he's the one who came up with a plan. He's the one who said, it's gonna be a free gift. And he's the one who said, we gotta make it available for everybody so it's free to anyone who accepts it. Now next week, we're gonna wrap up the series by talking about, so what does the gospel mean for me today? And we're going to look at Romans chapter 5. And this is what we're going to learn next week. How can you rejoice regardless of what going, what's going on in your life? See, And I'll ask you two questions to get you ready for next week. If you're a Christian on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, what level is your joy? Now here's the second question. Why is it so low? See, as Christians, it's, Christianity was designed to get better and better and better. But it rarely does. Why? Well, the gospel addresses that. We're gonna talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you that in while we were yet sinners, you gave your son Jesus to die for us. I pray for those who are so close right now. It's a, they're just a small step of faith away from acknowledging that the only way they can have a relationship with you is through what Jesus has done for them. I pray they could take that step today. And that immediate on this Father's Day, what a great, great weekend to come home to the Father. May they make that decision this weekend. In your name we pray. Amen.